All right, Jeanette. Yeah, we are good with that. Just FYI, it, the audio does drop off a little bit sometimes. It's nothing that you're doing wrong. It's some technical issue that we haven't been able to solve yet, but we do want to proceed just so you know in case there are any comm problems there. So with that, if you give me a thumbs up, I will start the event. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? I'm ready for the event. ACR, this is Mission Control, Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? I have you loud and clear. How me? We have you loud and clear. Please stand by for opening remarks. Hi, I'm Carlos Schermetto, Upward Bound Program Coordinator. And while it doesn't get much more upward than NASA and the ISS, we're here today to inspire you and help build your aspirational wealth. You might ask, what is aspirational wealth? It's the ability to main goal, maintain goals and dreams in the midst of barriers. And we know you face barriers, but that's where Upward Bound and the other TRIO programs come in. You have phenomenal engineering, drafting, and cyber technology programs in the district. We see that talent and intellect every day, and we want you to be the scientists, engineers, and astronauts we know you can be. So thank you. We want to send a special shout out to Jim De La Rosa and Genesis Yin Vargas for inspiring us, and to Desiree and SUSD for hosting. Now here's our first question. I'm not keen. I'm in second grade. I'm from Korea Elementary. And what does the sun look like and feel like in space? Hi there. Can I ask you to repeat your question, please? What does the sun look like and feel like in space? Uh, that's a great question. What does the sun look like and feel like in space? Well, the sun for us looks like um, the same way it does for you on Earth. We're still pretty far away. So the same way it looks to you on Earth, it looks to us in space. Um, however, because we don't have the Earth's atmosphere protecting, protecting us, we may feel a little bit, um, for me, when I go into our cupola where we have windows, it feels a little warmer to me. So, and also, you know, we're exposed to a little bit more radiation, but not dangerous in a dangerous way. We just don't stay in there very long. So the sun is the same here in this, on the space station, about 250 to 260 miles above the Earth. It's the same as it is for you. I'm Ellie Sayo. I'm in second grade. I go to Cadillac Elementary. What happens when the spaceship doesn't flat on right when coming back to Earth? So your question is, what happens to us when the uh, spaceship come, brings, takes us back to Earth and lands on Earth? Well, when we land on Earth, um, we just feel gravity suddenly. So right now, as we're about 250 miles from the Earth's surface, the um, gravity has um, decreased very much for us. So we're in like micro G. So once we land back on Earth, we can feel Earth's gravity. And so because we haven't felt that in six months, it's going to feel very bizarre for us. So it's the same thing, the space shuttle Dragon brings us to the space station, all of a sudden we feel, we feel micro G. When we return, we go back to regular gravity. Hi, my name is Jamal Bukadir. I'm a sophomore here at Sunnyside High School and my question is, how do spacecraft make artificial gravity? Well, here on our spacecraft, we, on our, um, in the space station and on the Dragon vehicle, we don't have um, gravity. But we can have experiments here in Micro-G that have gravity. And what it takes is a rotational force, which creates a centri centripetal force, a centrifugal force that pushes us out, and then you can start feeling um, gravity. So we don't really have gravity here on the space station or on the um, spacecraft, but we have experiments that have a rotating will that can create a, that can simulate gravity.
Hello, my name is Lana Arbisu, and I'm from Tucson, Arizona, and I have a question for you guys. Here's my question. What has been the most memorable or significant moment of your mission so far, and how, how has your experience on the International Space Station impacted your perspective on space exploration and human life beyond? Thank you. Well, let me start by saying, one of the, you know, every day here is a significant event. Um, being in uh, microgravity is very unusual, and so every day is, is amazing, it's a gift. Um, but for me, one of the most significant things that has happened so far was the total eclipse and the way that we were able to view it from the space station. The way that we saw it was we saw a shadow moving along the surface of the Earth. So that's how we viewed it. And it was amazing to see an eclipse from a different perspective. And that's the thing that we get from here. We get a different perspective on um, our planet, Earth. We get a different perspective on different events like um, eclipse, um, even storms. We see storms on Earth from a very different perspective. So, you know, there's um, a whole um, significance of being here on the space station just because we get a different perspective on many, many things. And that to me is um, very important for me. Hello, my name is Yarani Calderon Valenzuela. I'm a junior at this review high school. And my question for you guys is, how does your job tie to the different types of engineering, more specifically mechanical engineering? And what would you say the most important type of engineering is for these kinds of projects? Well, for me, I wouldn't say that any single type of engineering is the most important. I think what ends up happening is once you become an engineer, a scientist, a researcher, your mindset changes. And that's what we need on the space station because doing research here is very different than doing research on the Earth. We're here as the eyes and the hands of researchers on Earth, and we can help um, produce good data for them. We can help um, their experiments go very well. So on the space station, we do all kind of experiments, including DNA sequencing, um, DNA, um, a lot of things with respect to our genetics. We do some, for example, today, working with the um, uh, SIR rack, which is the combustion integration rack, where we figure out how things burn in space. Um, we are working on a code atom lab today, and that's one where we can um, cool atoms down to some of the coolest temperatures in the universe. So all different types of um, engineering, science come into play being on the space station. And what it really takes is someone who's willing to learn at the end of the day. And so all types are welcome and needed here on the space station. Hi, my name is Thalia Diaz. I'm a junior here at Desiree, and my question is, what do you think about when you are going to space, and what do you think about while you're in space? What do I think about? Um, uh, well, what I was thinking as I was coming to space um, earlier, I was um, thinking how wonderful it would be to experience this for the first time, and then to feel um, the the rocket as it lifted us up off the ground and propelled us into space was amazing. So I'm just thinking about these experiences, staying in the moment and just trying to really experience that. And right now while in space, I'm making this my home. So what I'm thinking about is, this is my home. How do I take care of it? What do I need to do? So those are the kind of things that I've been thinking about while I'm here, but also enjoying the moment and experiencing the moment, taking pictures, um, calling people and sharing this with others. So there's a lot to think about um, while in space. Hi, my name is Asen Dominguez. I'm a senior in Study Hitsan High School. And my question for you is, what type of training, both physical and mental, does it require for you to be an astronaut in NASA and go to space? Well, a lot of the training is um, is very different than what you would experience outside of NASA. So some of the training that I've done that um, 
it includes all of the systems on board the um, International Space Station, but also you can do analog missions which help train you mentally and physically to do this. So some of the analog missions that you can do would be to live underwater, and that's called the NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations, or you can live in a cave. And so we have an experience where we go learn how to um, climb in and out of caves. We lived in the cave for five days, and we explored the cave. And that is what that teaches you is that you're in a high threat environment. How do you behave in a high threat environment? How do you do research in a high threat environment? Not that there's a threat imminent, but you know things can happen on some of these experiences. But understanding the risk that you're taking, um, understanding how to operate under those conditions is very important. But also, you know, a lot of the training that we do is back in Houston. We learn how to do robotics. We learn how to operate the robotic arm. We learn how to do spacewalks, and we do that in a very large pool that's 200 feet long, 100 feet wide, and 40 feet deep. We um, also learn how to Capcom and fly the T-38 jet. So all of these things help create a mindset so that when you do come to space, you have the proper mindset to work, uh, and operate safely, and perform at a high level. My name is Yara Lideral, so I'm a senior from Sunnyside High School. And my question is, if you have a headache, do you lay down or just float? So in space, you don't really lay down. Um, if you have a headache, you could take some ibuprofen, some Tylenol or something like that. But really, you do just float. And so inside of our small um, crew quarters, um, our cabin, we have sleeping bags that help hold us down so we don't float away while we sleep. So you don't really lay down in space. That's an interesting question. I like that. Hi, my name is Yareti Loramim. I'm a junior at Desert View High School. And my question is, do the plants that are grown on the space station contain any radioactive properties? If so, are they safe to consume like the spirulina? Well, right now, we don't have any plants growing right now inside our modules. but. Normally, they're, you know, the plants that we grow are regular plants that you would see on Earth. They do grow a little differently, but they're mostly, there's no radi radioactivity on the plants or in the plants. So they're, for the most part, edible. Hi, my name is Melanie Velarde de Cruz. I'm currently a senior attending Sunnyside High School. And my question for you today is, what is the most breathtaking or awe-inspiring moment you experience while up in space? Again, for me, the most um, awe-inspiring thing that I've uh, seen since being here in space um, is not just looking out the window and seeing the Earth. That is awe-inspiring. But also, along with seeing the Earth, awe-inspiring seeing the Earth at nighttime as well and looking at the atmosphere on the Earth at nighttime. But seeing the total eclipse across the Earth's surface was also very striking and very beautiful as well. So there's um, some great things that we can see from this vantage point. Hi, my name is Alexa Ledesma. I'm a junior at Desert View High School. And my question for you guys is how can neuroinflammation tests being conducted on space be conducted on Earth without the microgravity environment? I'm sorry, sweetie, could you repeat your question? How can the neuroinflammation tests being conducted in space be conducted on Earth without the microgravity environment? Well, that's an interesting question. Are you talking about the fluid shift to the brain? If you are, we can measure the pressure behind our eyes um, using um, different tools that we have. We can even use um, different eye exams here on the space station. So. I'm not sure which test that you're referring to, but in general, we can measure the interocular pressure behind our eyes, um, and that kind of can give us an in insight to some of the fluid shift that's in our bodies. But really, that's one of the main tests that we do to look at the, um, the pressure behind our eyes. Um, does that answer your question? Hello, NASA. My name is Anissa Melina, and I'm a senior at Desert View High School. My question for you is, what was the scariest experience you had on a mission in space? Well, 
Well, so far, I haven't had um, anything that was um, very extremely scary. Um, for me, you know, of course, you know, flying to space, you have to be a little nervous. If you're not a little nervous, you're not really human because all the training that you do can never prepare you for what um, is going to happen. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. And it's not um, anything to be afraid of, but it's just that nervousness of not knowing, of not knowing um, what's going to happen next and experiencing things for the first time. So I don't think that, um, for me at least, there's nothing that has been extremely scary for me at this moment in time. Hi, my name is Anissa Medrano. I'm a sophomore at Desiree High School. And my question is, what is the longest amount of time you've been in space? You want to know the longest time anyone has been in space? Um, that's a good question. Um, we've had several people who spent over 365 days in space. And we've had people who've um, spent like 665 days in space and even longer. So right now, one of the people that I'm on board with, Ala Kononenko, he's been in space longer than anyone. And so, and I'm not sure of the number of days actually that is. So there's been a couple of people who have spent continuously over 300 days in space, but um, also the number of visits that people have made to space um, varies as well. Hello, my name is Daniel Pacheco, and I'm the director of the TRIO Upward Bound Program. And on behalf of all the TRIO programs at Pima Community College, I would like to thank NASA, the Sunnyside Unified School District, and of course, you, the student, for participating in today's event. Again, thank you, and have yourself a great day. And thank you. I love what you're doing. Have a great day, guys. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.